Welcome to Straight Talk from the Dorothy Hodgkin Project, a new Oxford initiative to support women in science. This series offers insights and personal experiences from top scientists. Dorothy Bishop and Diane Newbery are old friends and colleagues with a shared interest in language disorders in children. They talk about encountering each other's work at the intersection between psychology and genetics and the challenges of working motherhood. From my point of view, it was just really exciting to get involved with geneticists because I had been doing twin studies um, which allow you to estimate how likely it is that something is inherited. But I didn't know anything about the actual sort of lab work that people did to look at genes and things. And so it, what was fantastic was to set up this uh, opportunity to talk to real geneticists. And one of the things that I tell people quite often is that I think one of the best things we did was to set up a joint journal club. Because the funny thing about that was that initially everybody's a bit sort of cagey and thinking, well, I don't really know anything about this and so on. But we, we set it up so that we would have um, some sessions on psychology paper, with a psychology paper we'd have half the time and the rest of the time we'd have a genetics paper. And we started out thinking, well, we don't understand anything about the genetics, so we need to have them explain stuff to us. And then what amazed us was that they sort of felt equally intimidated by the psychology. <laughs> and uh, it was the most useful thing we did, though, because we forced each other to sort of explain things at a level that each of us could understand. And we became much better at communicating and understanding the, the areas, which were quite complicated and technical. But it was also just a good way of getting to know people and yeah. you know forging a collaboration so that you had some idea what each other was doing. And I think just having that opportunity where, uh, because it's a mixed group of people to say, really, yeah. I, I didn't really get that. Yes. Whereas if you're in a group of genetic geneticists yes. or experts in your field, you might not necessarily yes. want to put your hand up and yes. say, what was that about? Yes. Sorry. Yes. But and sometimes you're quite relieved when a psychologist says, I don't understand that bit of genetics. <laughs> 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 oh, and then you have a very clear explanation from somebody yeah. instead. Your research on this population in Robinson Crusoe Island, I remember I sent you a paper that I just saw the abstract of and just thought it was a bit of a joke because it sounded so romantic, Robinson Crusoe Island, and here it was being reported as a place where there was a very high percentage of children with language problems. Um, and I, so I, just, I think I just sent the abstract to you or something, and then we have this colleague, Gina Conti Ramsden, who uh, is Peruvian and so knows the Spanish. So yeah. this island is off the coast of Chile, so you needed to know some Spanish. And I think you then took it forward uh, quite yeah, seriously. So I think the abstract w was written in English, but the paper itself was yes. written in Spanish. So I then had to take it to a Spanish colleague and say, can you tell me what did this say? <laughs> but reading it and seeing, um, so there's about the incidence of speech and language impairment on the island is about 35% of children have a speech and language difficulty. Um, and seeing those numbers and linked up with the fact that it's called Robinson Crusoe, but also the story behind it that it was recently colonised maybe five, six generations ago by a small number of people, which for a geneticist is a, a really interesting uh, situation because it means that they have re a reduced gene pool and in theory makes the genetics easier, although in practice, mm. maybe not. <laughs> um, and just reading it and thinking, this could be really interesting, it could be the next Fox PT, yes. it could be the next link in the language genetics. To me, the, the exciting points of science are the actual doing of it, and I mean, there's nothing more exciting than suddenly discovering that you, you know, you've got a set of data and you can see something coming out. I mean, I remember, when I was doing my twin analyses and some of these results came out where I could see very clearly that there were genetic effects on language disorders and they were really clear enough that you know there was no ambiguity about it and I remember being quite surprised because um, I think it's quite a useful thing in a scientist not to expect to get anything yeah. all that exciting because <laughs> most of the time you don't and you don't want to be perpetually disappointing or you don't want to um, really kid yourself all the time as well so, but you know, so you look at it and look at it, but see from every which way it's coming out that way. And I think that that excited me quite a lot when that yeah. first happened. But the low points are when you put in a huge amount of effort on something, and either it's just it's very boring, nothing of interest is there, um, or you, you've got something that you think is interesting, but you try and publish it, and then it gets rejected. And it can be it can be quite you have to be quite resilient because I think it's. Um, 
easy for outsiders to see the high points in a scientific career and what they don't see so much is the long slog and the fact that you need to be very attentive to detail and check everything and be you know you can you can spend a lot of time doing quite mundane things um, but you need to do that if you're going to do good science you, you, you just can't be slapdash. I remember it being such an exciting time being mm. able to just being able to work with all those different people from different fields, each an expert in their own field, and yes. just having those interactions. For me, as a, somebody straight out of university, it was such a valuable mm. development experience, and just having access to those people, being able to discuss things with them, and yes. to be able to, the, the amount that I learned there was just yeah. amazing. I mean, the, um, the other thing I do remember um, you saying, and also other people in your lab, was um, that your boss, Tony Monaco, was really good about you continuing to work part-time while you had children. And yeah. I remember being quite surprised because I hadn't really encountered anybody else in that situation before who had just been quite happy to go part-time for quite an extended period of time um, and without it you know, seeming to be a problem yeah. for in, in the Again, lab. I was very, very lucky. Yeah. Um, but it worked really well, I have to say, being able to to go part time but still having time to be able to work mm. and split it in that way. It made mm. me feel much better about both sides of the coin yes. about motherhood and the science yes. that I could still keep doing both. This is Straight Talk from the Dorothy Hodgkin Project. Our project supports women returning to science after taking a career break, and we urgently need your help. The more people who support us, the bigger the story and the bigger the impact. Please share this and make a gift today at www.dorothyhodgkinproject.com.